morning. Good morning. We're talking vines today. Um, you think about trees when you think about a forest, but you don't usually think about vines. In Oklahoma, vines are astonishingly important ecologically in our forest. And we'll talk about that today. I'll start with a couple of the common cultivated vines like English ivy. You can see what an impact that has on that tree. I kind of like that look. I only have one tree that's infested with it, so I let it go. It's not invasive. It doesn't spread. Uh, I'll probably ultimately lose the tree because that tree is competing with that vine for nutrients, for water, for light, and ultimately probably the vine's going to win. But I've got another tree right there and right there, so I'm not that worried and I kind of like the look. Um, one kind of common theme we'll hit today is how many different types of vines there are. Here is Virginia creeper, and you can tell it, it's always got five leaflets, or usually has five leaflets that look like a palm. It's called palmately compound leaf because this whole thing is actually just one leaf. Uh, the other thing we can notice here is different vines have different strategies of how to climb. Virginia creeper and English ivy have what are called adventitious roots. If we can kind of turn that, yeah. you can see these little roots that grow out of a stem. Any root that grows out of a stem is called an adventitious root. That helps it grab on to the tree. That's one strategy to how a vine, which is relatively small in girth usually, can get all the way to the top of the tree. It has to hold on somehow. You can take grapes like this right here. Their strategy isn't adventitious roots, it's tendrils. Those tendrils will grab onto things to help them climb. And that's how the grapevine can climb up onto the trellises. You can see how it's leafed out now. Um, last time we saw it, it wasn't completely leafed out. And I've got this middle grape with the two arms of the vine going out. And you can look at garden peas. And here's our garden peas for a really good example of how tendrils actually work. They grab around things and then they hold on and that gives that plant the opportunity to go vertical. Most vines are vines because they're fighting for light and they're cheating. They're letting the tree go through all the time and effort of growing the sturdy wood and maintaining the sturdy wood and then they're cheating and they're running up. Um, cool thing about tendrils, uh, we don't think about plants really responding to the environment, um, but the more we learn about plants, the more amazing it is how they respond to stimuli in the environment. That might be hormones that another plant has released, or it could be touch. So after I do this, if I come back tomorrow, that tendril will have bent trying to go around my finger. Somehow it's able to sense that I've touched it there, and it will bend towards it, and that gives it the opportunity to do the ramping or the wrapping around. All right, let's take a quick look at the rest of the garden. It's a good year. Our kale is coming in well. We've got great lettuce. We've got our cauliflower over there. Our radishes are doing well. Our spinach is doing great right now. Uh, so it's a good year so far for the garden. All right. We're back at the same spot we were at for one of your plants of the week, which was Smilax or Catbriar or Green Briar, one of the most common vines in the Oklahoma forest. It creates huge briars or tangles. You can see it too climbs with tendrils. There it is reaching out to grab it. It's spiny. That thing will cut you up as you're walking through the forest. Come over here and you can start to get an idea of how significant ecologically vines are in the Oklahoma forest. Here we have a grapevine, woody grapevine that climbs all the way up to the top. It's getting wrapped around by Japanese honeysuckle. Right here it's wrapping around the, uh, the grapevine. The grapevine is doing battle with big old poison ivy vine goes all the way up to the top. Here's the leaf of poison ivy. Leaves of three, let it be. Uh, that will give you a really bad uh, rash. 
you can just see how tangled all those vines are fighting with that tree for the light. There's a Virginia creeper going up on the um, poor walnut trying to fight it all off. Here's another good example of poison ivy right here. Leaves of three, let it be. That Parthenocissus, the uh, Virginia creeper, can kind of fool you sometimes because it has sometimes three leaves on the younger ones, but if you look on the older, you can see um, the five leaves, the five palm-shaped leaves of Virginia creeper. Here's another poison ivy. That's how thick it can get here. It's right next to Virginia creeper. Here's your Virginia creeper leaf with sometimes it has three leaves and can kind of fool you into thinking, uh-oh, but if you look on other leaves next to it, you'll see that Virginia creeper is going to have the five leaves. Uh, over here you can look at a Dutchman's pipe. Here's the leaf of Dutchman's pipe, kind of heart-shaped leaf. Um, there's a pipe vine swallowtail that lays its eggs on here and the larvae feed exclusively on this plant. This doesn't climb with tendrils. It doesn't climb with adventitious roots. It just wraps around things. A vine that just wraps around thing is called a wraps around things is called a bine. And you can see it's actually just wrapped around itself. It used to have a tree limb to hold on. The tree limb has died and it's just sitting there hanging. Um, in the forest, the canopy is a huge source of biodiversity. More stuff up there probably than down on the forest floor. And in Oklahoma, these vines contribute so significantly to the little pockets and niches, um, ecological niches up there because you get tangles of things like that. The, uh, I think the reason, my theory on the reason why vines are so significant in, e in Oklahoma is vines prefer ecologically edges, the edge of things. So if you go to the tropics, you'll find most vines, or at least most commonly, you can see again, this is the invasive Japanese honeysuckle. Here, there's the honeysuckle flower that if you want a little treat, you can pull it off and carefully pull the stigma through. And as it goes through, you get a little sweet spot. Let me see, try it again. I'm gonna pull it, and that's pulling the style, which is then pulling the stigma, the female part of the flower, and as it comes out, you get a little bit of sweetness. But, good example of a invasive vine. Some of the worst vines we know, in terms of inv or worst invasive species we know, are vines. Kudzu is a good example. You'll see a couple other examples of invasive. Japanese honeysuckle is one. But in any case, edges are where vines thrive the most, and Oklahoma is all about edges because we're where those western prairies come in and do battle with the eastern forest. So you get pockets of prairie, and then forest, and then prairie, and forest. Another good example of Smilax here, the catbriar with its tendrils looking for some tree to grab onto. And behind me here is a good example of how, what trees have to put up with. Here we've got Smilax coming up on the tree. Behind that we've got Virginia creeper fighting to get to the top of the tree. We've got an invader species, Euonymus or winter creeper, um, which is trying to get up there. You've got Clematis or Virgin's Bower. Here. This also climbs with tendrils, fighting to get up to the top of this tree, and oftentimes it'll kill a tree. This tree is in bad shape, um, and I think that's probably more to the, due to the tornado than uh, the, um, the vines at this point, but it just is a tremendous, has a tremendous impact on a tree to try to grow with that sort of weight and that sort of thievery of all its water and nutrients. Uh, so in any case, we're in the cross timbers where east meets west. Um, 
a lot of edges, and we're going to go across the creek. So we had this bridge installed during the tornado. Huh. Uh, another way that vines will climb, we've got the tendrils, we've got the adventitious roots, we've got the binding around. They will, uh, they will just kind of grab onto the tree and use it as an elevator. So as the tree grows, the vine will grow, and it just gets lifted up as the tree gets higher. All right, safely across. Nicely done. Uh, woody vines in the tropics called lianas um, form a really important part of that ecosystem as well. But if you go farther east in the United States, you're not going to see as many different vines. And if you go farther west, when you hit the prairie, obviously you aren't going to see as many different vines. Here we go, euonymus or creeping, our winter creeper, all those adventitious roots allowing it to hold on, having a major impact on that tree. Here's our poison ivy starting to climb up that tree. Here's a wild rose. Smells beautiful. Really great smell. Um, this is also kind of like a vine. It can grow kind of like a bush or a shrub here, but if you look across the way, it looks a lot more like a vine climbing all up through there. It has a different strategy for climbing. It has these prickles, and these prickles kind of grab onto different plants and allow it to grab and go and they're kind of curved back so they're like grappling hooks that it uses to climb up and kind of scramble over everything. Uh, another Dutchman's pipe you can see that binding strategy as it goes up without tendrils without adventitious roots but it's still able to climb because it just twists around something as it grows. Uh, you'll notice how green it is in here. Uh, lots of wildflowers right now uh, this is the eastern forest, and these are called east, uh, uh, ephemeral wildflowers, or uh, spring ephemerals. Um, ephemeral means short-lived, just going to last for a little bit of time. Right when spring hits, before the leaves are up in the canopy, oh, look at that vine right there. There's a good example of a grapevine, how big and how strong. Oh. I almost made it up and then I saw the poison ivy right behind it and I got scared but super strong you can climb on them like Tarzan if you want um, and they'll hold you they're actually woody they aren't herbaceous so in any case spring ephemerals before the leaves come out on the uh, trees there's still light that gets down to the forest floor so all of these plants have about one month to sprout and bloom before it gets too shady in here for other plants to, uh, for the plants to grow. So you have this burst of total green that comes out right in the spring and this will all be over in another two weeks or so and it'll be much darker in here. There's a good view over there of just how tangled this gets. We'll be coming back there in just a minute. How tangled this gets in this forest. All right, continue on down the forest path here. And that spring ephemeral is really kind of a eastern forest event. Um, and we are just so far on the eastern edge of it. Um, there are a couple plants that I've found in here. Royal fern is an example uh, that don't really occur anywhere Farther, farther west. If this isn't the westernmost population, it's close to the westernmost population. Here's another good example of our rose. Uh, another good chance to get a view of poison ivy. 
here with your leaves of three, let it be. This vine right behind it is a poison ivy vine. If you cut the vine, that sap will get you just as bad as the leaves. Actually, it'll get you worse than the leaves in terms of uh, irritation. Here's trumpet creeper, another vine climbing up. And these are just battling these plants. Let's head into the forest for a cool vine. Called hops. This is what they use for flavoring for beer. Um, and here we have a probably native hop. And let me see if I can pull off. This climbs by binding, but also, oops, my hop. There's little hooks on there that it's using to kind of grappling hook there. So it's a really scratchy thing, so much so that it sticks to stuff. So it's kind of using two strategies. It's using the binding and the hooking. And there's the hop leaf. Uh, I've, uh, I just found this for the first time on my property. Uh, this week, so I'm kind of excited. I'm going to watch it this year and see if it produces any and who knows maybe try to brew some beer with native hops so. All right, head on down to the far end of our forest path Listen for the birds as we go good last stop. Um, you can see the invader species, Japanese honeysuckle, how it's starting to cover everything. Um, before too long, this whole ecosystem is just going to get wrecked by this vine and by winter um, creeper, um, another invader species. So sad. Um, we'll do another episode on uh, on invasive species before too long, uh, but. It's a frustrating problem, and once you have something like kudzu or winter creeper or Japanese honeysuckle, there's really no getting rid of it. Here's another vine, uh, creeping cucumber in the cucumber family. You can see it climbs by binding, by winding its way up. And then we are at, oh, here's Ampelopsis, another member of the, uh, another vine in the, uh, grape family in the Vitaceae. So there's Ampelopsis there. Next to it, another member of the grapevine is Parthenocissus or Virginia creeper. And then all the big vines you see, um, for example, this guy is river grape, which is probably the most significant of vines in our forest. So take home message is when thinking about how a forest operates, particularly in Oklahoma, don't forget about the vines. They play a very significant role. All right, thank you guys for joining me, and we'll see you next episode. Um, walking back from our vine talk, we came into a black rat snake coming out of the chicken coop. Uh, they eat the eggs, and they startle the chickens. Uh, and then the chickens stop laying eggs and they try to get out of the coop and then they lay out of the coop So when we get black rat snakes in the coop, we relocate them. We don't kill them um, We don't kill any snakes. We love having it. We're just going for the biodiversity uh, But we will put this guy in a pillowcase and move him on down the road to a new happy living somewhere else So fun piece of wildlife from Walker's backyard